What's up, champs? Welcome to another episode of the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast, brought to you by two guys with some non-COVID cold symptoms who are going to power through anyway here uh, in a very weird week. Uh, thank you for joining us. I don't know if I said we're brought to you by Keeping Carlson, but we are. Uh, I'm your host, Louis Ezekiel, and joining me tonight, my pal and yours, Jeremy Versillo. Jeremy, how are you doing on this fine, not very busy, Tuesday evening of hockey? Well, other than a, a bit of a cough, yeah, I'm doing pretty great. I'm enjoying watching the three games that are on leading up to the All-Star break. Yeah, you know, it's it's a little bit of a slow week here uh, in terms of games played. It's obviously going to pick up big time when we uh, get back on the other side of the All-Star break, and we've got plenty to talk about what's happening then. Uh, and luckily, you know, the uh, the hockey gods saw fit to bless us with a trade to discuss, so uh, we've definitely got plenty to talk about here. I did want to take a minute just to, to take a leaf out of the... Um, patron cast. Uh, if you are a patron of Keeping Carlson, you get a patron cast every month. Uh, they're really outstanding, fun shows. You get to see uh, Elon and Brian a little more laid back than they typically are. They always answer every question, which is uh, just you know something that I think is really cool that they do is is making sure they make the time. Um, but one question was asking a bit about you know getting to know them a little more for new listeners who maybe haven't been around for the uh, all of the years that Keeping Carlson has been around. Uh, and, you know, as a new host on Short Shifts, I thought, you know, maybe we'll give you a chance to introduce yourself a little bit about what uh, what do the people need to know uh, about Jeremy Versilla? What do you what do you do when you're not talking to us about hockey and when you're not uh, performing uh, admirably in the cacupful and in the babuffle with me? Well, uh, I'm a software engineer from Seattle, Washington. So I am a big Seattle Kraken fan. I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., so I also have a soft spot for the Washington Capitals. Outside of my many hockey-related hobbies, including fantasy hockey, uh, short shifts, and uh, playing hockey, I'm a big golfer and hiker. I love traveling to national parks and camping and hiking, just getting outside to see what the natural beauty of this country has to offer us. Hey, right on. That's awesome. I know everybody I know who lives in the Pacific Northwest loves to hike because it's, you know, uh, simple to do. You've got lots of great places to do it. Um, you know, I'd love to get out there. I, I had a really good trip. I, I went with some friends up from, um, uh, Portland to Seattle, uh, to check out Experience Music Project, which was really fun. Uh, just have a lot of good memories of, uh, that part of the country. Uh, and my dad was born in DC. So, uh, a cool kind of connection there as well. Uh, all right. Well, well, thank you for taking that opportunity. Much obliged. And, uh, hopefully, yeah, you know, we get to know, uh, get to know a little bit more about the hosts. Uh, Jeremy is, is joining short shifts for the long haul. He has agreed to come on, uh, throughout the remainder of the season. Uh, unfortunately, Ben will not be rejoining us, at least, uh, for the remainder of this season. Uh, taking some well deserved time off, uh, after nearly four years of short shifts. So, uh, hopefully he is enjoying his time. Uh, and we've got someone else joining us on Thursday. I don't know if I should tease. Uh, or if I should just, uh, just say out loud, we'll just go for it. I think, I think it was already mentioned on, uh, the patron cast. So once again, an inside look, uh, if you are a patron of Keeping Carlson. Um, but Shams Ben Amore will be joining us. Uh, you probably know him or may know him as, uh, the person behind, uh, along with Elon, uh, so much of the great game day tweets, uh, that you see. Uh, I don't think anyone is more tuned into the world of fantasy hockey than Shams because he is, uh, just just up to the minute at all times. I'm going to have to ask him about how he manages that feat. Uh, all right, but enough of our intro warm up. Uh, the people want to know uh, what is the latest with uh, the biggest news of the fantasy week so far, and that is Bo Horvat has finally uh, been traded from Vancouver. He is headed to Long Island. Uh, and headed the other way, Anthony Beauvillier, Aturati, and a 2023 protected first round pick. Uh, Jeremy, you kind of covered the Islanders side of things. So, uh, you know, that's where the most important piece of this deal is headed in Bo Horvat. Uh, what do you see uh, on the horizon for Horvat and for the Isles? So the first impact for Bo Horvat, I think I've seen a lot of places where people are like, oh, he's going to the Islanders. He's never going to score again because the Islanders don't score. And while I won't argue with you that 
the island isn't a great place for scoring. It's kind of the uh, the desolate wasteland of fantasy hockey. I don't think it's as bad as people think it'll be. It's not like Vancouver's that high scoring of a team also. And how much of Vancouver's scoring was purely because of Bo Horvat. I do think he'll regress from his current 90-point pace because that's honestly a bit over his head to begin with. But if you were expecting 70 points rest of the season in Vancouver, I don't think it's going to be much different in the island. I, I expect 65 to 70 point pace. His wingers go from being Miller and Garland to two out of Barzal, Lee, Palmieri, Parise, Bailey, all perfectly viable top six wingers to uh, help get him the puck to score. I think the most frustrating thing about this is it happened at a time where we may not see practice lines for another week here. Yeah, I think that does definitely complicate things. Like it puts us in a position where, you know, we can, we can make some guesses, but, you know, we're not going to know anything, uh, very, very clearly, uh, for a little while yet. So we're, we're kind of on pins and needles a little bit, uh, here moving forward. So, you know, I, I think, I think you're right that it's not such a big downgrade. You know, I do think there is kind of a cap on scoring, uh, on Long Island, just sort of in general. You know, we don't see a whole lot of, uh, of super high paces, but like you said, you know, not necessarily, you know, he wasn't exactly, you know, going gangbusters in Vancouver either. Uh, and there were obviously, you know, he may just, just be very happy to get that change of scenery, uh, as well. Um, what about the possibility that Matt Barzell, you mentioned he could potentially end up, uh, as Horvat's wing? That obviously is not a position we're used to seeing. Uh, do we feel like that is something that is likely? Uh, what, how might that alter his outlook for, for Matt Barzell? So I'll admit, I'm not sure where this rumor started just because I haven't been as plugged in. I was uh, traveling last weekend, so I missed some of the days of news. But I'm seeing in a lot of places that the expectation is Barzal moves to right wing with Horvat as the first line center. And then I'm guessing probably either Anders Lee or Josh Bailey as the left wing there. Uh, I looked a little bit more into it and Barzal has been downright terrible in the faceoff dot this year. He's down at 35.9%, which obviously winning faceoffs isn't the only thing a center has to do. But it is a pretty easy fix to, you know, switch from a 39% guy to a 55% guy. All of a sudden you have possession of the puck quite a bit more when they're on the ice and can do some good things offensively. And then the other reason this kind of makes sense is the Islanders also have Brock Nelson and uh, JG Peugeot, who are really good centers. And you don't really need to bump one of them to the fourth line. That would just hurt your team as a whole. So I think Barzell's going to shuffle to the wing, and then we'll see who falls into the left wing next to the two of them. But that could be some pretty good firepower. Yeah, I do think that's really interesting. You know, this obviously is not a team that is uh, shallow down the middle, right? Like uh, you might have expected a, a team with a little more a little more need down the middle. Uh, to pick up Horvat, but you know when you have an opportunity, I think to pick up a high skill player, you go ahead and do it. And as you said, maybe maybe Barzal can thrive uh, without that uh, face off responsibility. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, so, what do you think uh, that top power play is going to look like if this guy is, uh, you know, the big haul? You got to imagine Horvat ends up as a power play one guy. That means somebody's getting the boot. Yeah, Horvat was a huge power play specialist in Vancouver. He scores a lot of his goals on the power play. They ran a, a bit of a set play where he'd go from the net front and kind of flare out to the high slot for a high percentage one-timer there. We'll see if it may take a bit of time for the Islanders to get that play down or if they're going to use it at all. But given that he plays the net front position, I actually think it might be Anders Lee who gets bumped off the top power play. Uh, Elon said Palmieri, and so maybe that's another option. I don't think... Barzal's going to get bumped for sure, or Brock Nelson. I mean, I think you make a good point there, right? Like, I think if it's if you're just trying to put the five best players out there and trying to make it work, then it makes sense to to have Paul Mary be the one who leaves. Uh, all due respect, uh, but yeah, maybe if it's a position like comfort sort of thing, uh, maybe it does make more sense for it to be Lee, and obviously that would be a big hit to him uh, if that was the case. Um, so this. Uh, 
We've also seen, you know, maybe potential for this to be uh, a bonus for Sorokin or or whatever goalie uh, is starting any particular game uh, for the Islanders. I mean, yeah, having a better offensive uh, team in front of you, I think, will do it. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, we don't really see Horvat as being a big, you know, defensive impact guy, um, you know, but if he can convert a few, you know, a few more goals, then maybe you're looking at a few more wins. But I, I don't think this is something that changes the outlook for the goalies a whole ton. Uh, we also have to think about what happens then to power play one in Vancouver. Um, could see Besser moving up, but it kind of feels like Beauvillier has to get a shot coming the other way, right? You know, if Kuzmenko can get power play one time over Brock Besser, then why shouldn't Beauvillier? Uh, you know, they're ultimately going to want to show uh, that he'll be worth the price. And I think overall, this change of scenery could be good for Anthony Beauvillier. Uh, you know, the Canucks are going to be incentivized to put him in a position to succeed, uh, since Bo Horvat was a pretty hefty price. Um, you mentioned that maybe we could see him do something similar to what Tyler Toffoli did in limited action a few years back, uh, when he got that opportunity to be a power play one guy for the Nucks. Uh, as for the other piece, Achirati, uh, you know, according to Dabra Prospects, he's a guy who has 80 point upside, although obviously, uh, that's going to be a while in coming. Um, they describe him as a play driving offensive center, plays a solid 200 foot game, uh, can be a dual threat because he can dish and finish. Um, so, you know, he, they said he needs to work on consistency and discipline, but that he projects to become a very good top six center. So thank you, Dabber Prospects, for letting me crib some notes from you. Uh, I also know that Nicole Sherman, who is an Islanders knowledgeable person and interesting Twitter follow, uh, was a huge fan. So I imagine she's sad to see him uh, going the other way. Um, but I know you had some other background on Ati Rati as well. Yeah, Rati is a bit of a curious case because... At one point, he was actually the presumed number one overall pick in 2021. And a lot of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, wasn't he a second round pick? And that's right. He had such an awful draft season to the tune of six points in 35 games in Liga and a demotion to the U20 Liga squad that he fell all the way from a potential number one overall pick to the middle of the second round. Now, he did have a big bounce back year last year with 40 points in 41 games in Liga and is doing a decent job at adjusting to the AHL as a 20-year-old this year. He's got 12 points in 27 games and has been up on the NHL squad a few times. So I think this may be a case of some people may have overreacted to a bad draft year and he's going to come back and sure, there's the 80-point upside that you mentioned, I see him more as a C2 type player with a lot of offensive talent, but maybe not the consistency that you want, which hopefully he'll grow into. But yeah, there's a lot of potential here. I actually think it was a great pickup for the Canucks. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Always nice if you can uh, steal a potential, you know, someone who was considered a first uh, later down in the second. Uh, just a couple other things we want to talk about before we get to some patron questions uh, with, you know, talk of the trade out of the way. And like we said, we'll know more once we see some lines uh, and we will bring that information to you just as soon as we have it. Um, but some good news uh, out of Boston, Jeremy, what's uh, what's going on with the JDB uh, side of things? Yeah, Jake DeBrusque, who was in fantastic form before unfortunately getting hurt two different places in the Winter Classic, he is skating in a non-contact jersey and is apparently going to play their first game after the break, which is either Friday or Saturday of next week. Uh, I think this is great for DeBrusque. He'll probably jump right back to where he was on the top line and top power play, especially since the Bruins have started to struggle a bit with him out of the lineup. It could be a little bit of that old coach. Well, it was working before. We have to go back to it. Yeah, that'll be a nice jump start, I think, to a lot of fantasy lineups, too, to get DeBrus back. He has been a a gem uh, of a find for for a lot of teams. I was able to pick him up for just two bucks right at the end of the auction. So that was a nice one. Uh, Another development we've really seen, uh, you know, we had some discussion of the Buffalo three-headed goalie monster uh, right around the same time we were talking about that for Carolina, which got sorted pretty quick with... uh, uh, Kachikov, uh, headed down, uh, to the, uh, to the support squad. Uh, since the start of the new year, this, this has clearly, you know, kind of sorted itself out. Uh, uh, 
Uka Pekka Lukanen uh, has had nine starts since the beginning of the new year. Craig Anderson has had four, and Eric Comrie has had just two. Uh, the fact that we have those three goalies kicking around, maybe cutting into UPL starts a bit. Um, you know, you would imagine that those two Comrie starts would have probably gone to him otherwise, or at least been split between the two of them. But he's clearly the number one. Uh, Comrie obviously is a sure drop. I'm sure nobody's holding on to him. Um, but I would say Anderson, uh, probably worth a stream when he starts, uh, because that's a team that can win on any given night, uh, with the scoring that they have, but definitely no reason, uh, to hold on to Craig Anderson. Yeah, I think it's Lukanen's crease until he falters. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Comrie get shipped out at the deadline to make some roster space because I don't think he can be sent to the minors without them losing him on waivers. Yeah, if they can get something back for him, I imagine they'll try to, but I wonder if teams might just try to wait him out and see if they uh, attempt to send him down and they can just get him for a waiver pickup. All right, uh, we are headed into a short little break here. Uh, You are listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. Uh, we've got a couple, we got a patron question. We got one that came from Twitter, actually tweeted at Brian and Elon. Uh, this one said, listen to a podcast that suggested selling high on Morrissey currently have him. Would you trade him for Carlson or Quinn Hughes? This is a points league that counts goals, assists, plus minus power play points, shots, and blocks. What do you think, Jeremy? You know, those two offers are kind of a big math for me. I see all three of those players as about equivalent heading through the rest of the season. There's going to be some shuffling around of the teams. Uh, San Jose may trade Meyer. Uh, Vancouver just traded Horvat. And Morrissey, at the very least, should be a positive on the plus minus and on the block side. And the points, shots, and power play points could be similar because I don't think Morrissey's losing that slot to Pionk anytime soon. I think if you're going to sell high on Morrissey, you have to shoot higher than that. Maybe for an early round defenseman who is underperforming, the two that came to mind to me were Victor Hedman and Chris Letang. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like, I I think I would prefer Hedman to Letang right now, just because he is starting to show some signs of, of busting out a little bit from some of the doldrums that he had earlier in the season. I wonder if I would make the deal for Carlson. I don't love the plus minus side of things, but also my strategy has always been to just ignore plus minus as a category entirely. Um, you know, just because I guess in a points league, it's a little different, but it's just, you know, uh, it's kind of random. Don't love it. Tell your, tell your, you know, commissioner to ditch that stat. Um, yeah, ignoring plus minus is always a great strategy in categories leagues. I do it almost every year and get so much surplus value at the other uh, other categories and then sometimes still win plus minus anyway because who knows with that stat. Because it's random, right? Yeah. And so I, I guess the one thing is Carlson kind of looks like a guy who can lead the offense right now. Like maybe if Meyer is gone – He just takes more shots, right? Like we've really seen him kind of look like the Carlson of old. So I don't mind that deal. Although I would be worried, you know, I guess to the extent that I am capable of worrying about plus minus, I would be worried about it uh, for both him and for, um, uh, Quinn Hughes. Quinn Hughes is kind of an empty calories guy. Luckily, it's not counting hits uh, in addition to blocks, but he's not a guy who gets a ton of blocks. He's kind of you can count him for assists, some power play points, and some shots. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really like that deal. I would certainly not trade Morrissey uh, for Quinn Hughes right now. I would consider it for Carlson, and I like it for Hedman too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I land with that. And I, you know, I love the idea of shooting your shot, right? Might as well go for it. If you're selling high, uh, go for your biggest offer first. And if that doesn't work and you're still feeling compelled to move him, uh, maybe you look at Carlson as an option as well. Um, patron Alex asked us, I, uh, I'm in a tight battle, uh, for the playoffs in Cupful, uh, carrying, uh, Carlson, Carlson with a C. Uh, the Washington defenseman uh, on his IR, who is unlikely to chip in until late, if at all, in the season. Given the risk that he comes with, what sort of player should I be pitching for from a team at the top? Um, I always have have trouble with these types of questions. It's really hard to weigh value, especially when you're talking, you know, so much risk with the potential that he might not be back, but also so much potential benefit that if he does come back, you know, you might be able to to pick him up for relatively cheap. Um, 
went through some possibilities. Uh, Elon chimed in, which was nice of him. He uh, had some suggestions, uh, such as Troy Terry, always fun to suggest because he's easy to fit into the lineup with that off-day schedule. Uh, maybe Maddie Barzal we talked about, who's been kind of cold, but might move over to the wing and could could maybe find some additional success. Uh, the guy I eventually settled on was Tarasenko, who I thought was a really interesting option. Um, you know, some reasons that I zoned in on Tank is first, he's got this terrible schedule around the All-Star break. Uh, so maybe if the other GM can, uh, move Carlson to IR and then stream in someone who gets a little more games, that might incentivize them to make the move. Uh, Tarasenko's on a cold streak with no points in the last five games, although the shots and the power play time have both been there. Uh, he's an injury risk too. You know, this is a guy who gets injured plenty himself. He just missed a game before starting this cold streak. He only played four minutes in the game that followed the one that he missed. You know, if you're grabbing an already injured guy, you might be more inclined to trade a guy who gets injured. So those are all like reasons why the person might be willing to trade Tank because of his own riskiness. But there's also upside for Tarasenko. Right now, his shooting percentage is the second lowest of his career. Uh, some of this recent slump has coincided with Rob Thomas's absence. I really think Tank can pick his game back up and be a valuable contributor. Um, but I think that the way he looks right now is rough enough that you might find someone willing to let him go for the potential that Carlson offers. Totally agreed. Like, if you can get Tarasenko for Carlson, I'd be doing it. I'm actually really down on John Carlson for the rest of the season. The last report I saw was that he's doing some light exercise and will be reevaluated at the end of February. Taking that, I'm assuming it means the earliest he's back is mid-March. So even in the leagues where I have a playoff spot locked in, I'm not even looking to trade for him. So as a seller, you almost may want to take anything you can get. Yeah, might as well dangle him out there and uh, see if you get any response from the league. Uh, three quick hot streaks to go through before we wrap up the show. Uh, one is just kind of an attaboy hot streak for a guy who, uh, you're not going to be able to pick up anywhere. I would imagine Brent Burns has six points in the last six games, even off of power play one, uh, for reasons unclear where Brady Shea has taken over. Uh, he's been effective with five of those points coming at even strength. Uh, Mike Amato, who runs Goalie Post, a friend of the Mega Show, who was just a guest on Sunday. Uh, he already beat us to the punch. He tweeted out, he says he doesn't think it's long before he takes Power Play 1 back from Shea. Uh, that was more or less what I wanted to say here. So uh, hang in there, Burns owners. Uh, obviously, things are going pretty nice for you already. Uh, and the Power Play light, I think, is on at the end of the tunnel. So uh, just hang in there, and I think uh, you're going to be in great shape. Yep, can't say anything else there. I think he had a point or two tonight in the uh, Carolina's 5-4 overtime victory against LA. Speaking of things that happened in tonight's games, a guy that we joked about last Short Shifts episode has forced himself to be talked about again, and that's Raphael Harvey Pinard on Montreal. He looks like one of those unheralded prospects who defies scoring expectations at every level, he basically jumped straight from the QMJHL to the AHL and started scoring at just under a point per game there. And then he's come up to the NHL and has five goals in seven games and is quickly climbing the Canadian scoring leaders board. He's also averaging three hits in a block per game with 1343 of ice time. So you could do a lot worse. The guy that I actually drew a comparison to is... He kind of looks a bit like Garnet Hathaway for the Caps, who absolutely has been worth a stream in peripheral heavy leagues on good weeks. Yeah, uh, I would think maybe um, Ely Tolvanen might be another comparable since he's been a guy who's been uh, on a bit of a hot streak and putting up some points despite kind of being in the teens uh, for minutes, not hitting quite as much. Um, for Tolvanen, but yeah, I, you know, if you're interested in Tolvanen, I think you should be interested in Harvey Pinard. Uh, love the name Raphael, by the way. That was my grandpa's name. You can see him over my shoulder when we're streaming, uh, on Twitch and, uh, one of my son's middle names. Uh, and Tolvanen is the last guy I wanted to talk about here. Goals in three straight games. He's playing on Seattle's most consistent line. I know he came up on the mega show, so I'm, I'm repeating myself a little bit here. Um, but that Bjorkstrand, Gord, and Tolvanen line has three times as much time on ice together as the next closest combination over the last three games. 
so, you know, they just have managed to stick together uh, in a way that the other lines haven't. And I think there's got to be some value there. Uh, they've been playing high event hockey, scoring four goals and allowing three in those three games. Um, he's getting right around 14 minutes a game, but he's averaging about three shots a game over the last couple weeks. Uh, and Seattle's got a pretty favorable schedule coming out of the all-star break, which I believe Elon mentioned as well. Uh, they've got four games, uh, with Friday and Sunday games against the Ranger and Flyers. Uh, so might be a guy worth taking a look at. I picked him up in Bubupful and he's been, uh, doing very nicely for me, uh, ever since I went out and grabbed him. All right, Jeremy, we were worried we wouldn't have enough content, and yet here we are. We That trade really made hay for us. Uh, so great to have you. Really excited to welcome Shams uh, for the next show. And uh, yeah, we are uh, on our way out of here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Please give us a follow at Short Shifts KK. Brian and Elon, of course, can be found at Keeping Carlson. Always recommend you follow at Game Day Lines, at Game Day Goalies, at Game Day News NHL more than ever now uh, with Shams coming into the Short Shifts family. Uh, all of those tweets are organized nicely at gamedaytweets.com, and you can visit that site and the other great sites. We research our episodes at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, and Natural Stat Trick. Our intro and outro music was created by Pat Roach. John Reed is our digital media producer. And until we see you next time, play smart and keep your shifts short.